Hello everyone and welcome to the presentation of our paper Modular Specification and Verification of Closures in Rust. I am Aurel Bili from ETH Zurich and this has been a joint effort with Fabian Wolf, Christoph Matea and Peter Miller from ETH Zurich Switzerland and Alexander J. Summers from the University of British Columbia, Canada. To begin with, let me try to convince you that reasoning about closures is difficult. Here is a short code example in everyone's favorite language, JavaScript. We see a function foo which takes a single argument o. We set the field x of this object to 1. Then we create a closure, counter. Notice that this function takes no arguments but still refers to o in its body. This means that o is taken, or captured, from the scope surrounding the declaration. This is called a closure. The closure itself increments field x of our object, then returns the new value. At the end of the foo function, we call our closure once and return the same value as it did. If you are at least a little familiar with closures or JavaScript, I hope you'll agree with me that the function foo should return the number 2. That is, the initial value 1 assigned to o.x incremented by 1. But what if we add this innocent looking call to bar to our function? This simple addition is enough to cause trouble. To see why, consider a bar function defined like so. In this example, bar somehow obtained access to the same object that was passed to foo and changed its field x. With this change, foo would now return 43 instead. Of course, the point of the previous example was not JavaScript is bad. We can reproduce the same exact situation in languages like Scala, C++, Python, and many more. Now let's look at the same example translated to Rust. The syntax is a little bit different, but we are doing the same as before. Our foo function accepts o as its argument, sets its field x to 1, then creates a closure counter that increases the field and returns the new value. Crucially, no matter what the definition of bar here is, we know that it cannot modify our object. If we simply inline the problematic bar definition from before, we will see that the Rust compiler will raise an error. The error is helpful and verbose, and we can summarize it as the state captured by a closure can only be modified by that closure itself. This is one of the many consequences of Rust's ownership type system. Among other things, the type system also prevents data races, memory leaks, and aliasing issues. But of course, memory safety isn't everything. We get memory safety for free thanks to the ownership types, but there is much more to writing correct and verified programs. We would like to ensure that programs are functionally correct. This includes the behavior of individual closure calls, sequences of closure calls, or uses of higher order functions such as map or filter. As we will see many times in this talk, the type system will help us reach these properties, but we still need to design methodology suited to specific closure problems. As a very quick reminder of prior work in our group, we can verify functional specifications using the Prusty verifier. The concrete syntax uses Rust annotations, which start with a hash symbol, followed by the type of the specification, and contain an expression that can use a superset of Rust syntax. Here is an example of a precondition, stating that this function can only be called if the argument s is greater than 2. And here we have a couple of postconditions, stating the relation between the values modified by this function and their original old values. Let's get back to closures and some of the issues we addressed with our paper. Once again, we see the foo function with the counter closure. This time, we will call the function twice, storing the result in values a and b. In between these calls, we add a for loop, which will simply call the closure n times, where n is an additional argument to the foo function. Finally, we want to assert that b, the result of the last call to the closure, 
is greater or equal to a the result of the first call to the closure. This assertion will always succeed, but we want to prove this statically. So why should this be challenging? Let's recap the problem. We know the initial state captured by the closure. We can also easily figure out the state after the first call. However, the for loop is a complication. We don't know n statically, so we don't know exactly how many times counter was called either. This assertion therefore becomes problematic, as summarizing the effect of a loop with an unbounded number of iterations is difficult for automatic verifiers. Let's visualize the control flow of foo, focusing only on the state captured by the closure. Note the cycle corresponding to the for loop. While we don't know the exact values o.x will take, we know that it can only be increasing. In other words, each state has a greater or equal relationship to its predecessor. We can express this fact about the closure using an invariant annotation. o.x is greater than or equal to o.x in any previous state. This is a feature we added to Prusty and we refer to such two state invariants as history invariants. In general, these invariants can be used to establish properties preserved across any number of calls to the closure. Finally, we add a post condition to our closure, which connects the values it returns to the invariant. With this, we can prove the assertion. Note that even if we add a call to some bar function and allow it to call counter, we know the history invariant cannot be violated. To summarize, we wanted to prove properties preserved across an unbounded number of closure calls. We have used history invariants to achieve this. Note that the history invariants only work because of the guarantees of Rust's type system, namely that the captured state is only modifiable by the closure itself. Let's look at another example. Here we see a higher order function, that is, a function which accepts another function as an argument. Note that the type signature of HOF allows any closure to be passed as an argument as long as it has the correct signature. So how can we ensure that HOF is only given closures which will cause the assertion in its body to always succeed? To do this, we introduce specification entailments into Prusty. A specification entailment expresses the expected specification for all future calls to a given closure. In this case, we will add a precondition to f that says it can only be called with a positive argument. And we add a postcondition that says the values it returns will also be positive. Referring only to the properties given in the specification entailment, we can prove the assertion in HOF. The argument 5 is positive, so the call can be made, and we know the result is positive, so it must be greater or equal to 0. Of course, higher order functions are only useful if we can call them. Let's consider a concrete closure CL, which we might want to pass to HOF. We will add a post condition to the closure, stating that it returns double the argument we called it with. However, we also have an integer division operation in the closure. Rust would panic at runtime if a division by zero was attempted, so to prove absence of panics, we add a precondition that i is not negative 5. So how do we verify whether we can pass CL to HOF? We know the call is valid if the specification of the closure is at least as strong as the specification expected by HOF. This is true if two conditions are satisfied. Firstly, that the precondition expected by HOF implies the precondition of the closure. This is true, as i being positive does mean it cannot be negative 5. Secondly, that the precondition expected by HOF together with the postcondition of the closure imply the postcondition expected by HOF. Once again, this is true, as the double of a positive number is also positive. We have verified both of the conditions, so we know the call to HOF can be made. You may also know the conditions we imposed as behavioral subtyping. To summarize, we needed a way to specify the expected behavior for closures passed to higher order functions. 
We have used specification entailments to achieve this and behavioral subtyping to verify whether specification entailments are satisfied by concrete closure specifications. Once again, we rely on Rust's type system to know that the specification of a closure, including any history invariants, remains true while the closure is live. Let's get back to our example. We can hide the precondition for now and make a small change to the code. Instead of making an assertion as part of HOF, we return the value of the closure call and make a more precise assertion at the call site. With the specific closure we have given to HOF, we know the result will be 10. But how do we express this property as a postcondition of HOF? We would like to be able to talk about its result in terms of a call to a closure, but we cannot rely on the specification of any particular closure. To resolve this issue, we introduce call descriptions. A call description says that a call to a given closure will happen, and it allows us to specify assertions about the state before the call and after the call. In particular, we can refer to the result of such a call in the post state. In this case, we know f will be called with the argument 5, and we know that its result will be the same as the result of HOF itself. Combining the concrete specifications of CL with the call description in HOF's postcondition, we can prove the assertion. To summarize, we needed a way to specify how closures are used by a higher order function and to be able to refer to the results of such calls without relying on any particular closure specification. We have used call descriptions to achieve this. Yet again, Rust's type system allows us to know precisely which state can be used and modified by a call description. So how well does all of this actually work? We have implemented our methodology as an extension to the Prusty verifier. This tool works as a plugin to the Rust compiler. The compiler compiles code provided by the user to the intermediate representation MIR, which is processed by Prusty and converted to Viper code. This code is verified by one of Viper's verification backends, both of which ultimately generate SMT queries and use a standard SMT solver, Z3, to check their validity. Errors, if any, are translated by Prusty and mapped back to their original locations in the Rust program. To be able to integrate with this architecture, we had to design an encoding of our methodology into Viper code and therefore first-order logic. The source code for our artifact, as well as an archive of it, are available online. The evaluation of our tool was twofold. Firstly, we used a test suite with a variety of cases taken from the literature, as well as examples corresponding to interesting functions of the Rust standard library. For instance, we specified and verified implementations of all higher order functions of the option type, as well as some methods of the vector type. As you can see in the table, all of our test cases used specification entailments, most used call descriptions, and some used history invariants. The verification time is in the order of seconds, not minutes or hours. Importantly, we have test cases with errors introduced. The verification time for these is virtually the same as their correct counterparts. It is important that errors are quickly identifiable to allow for an interactive verification workflow. Finally, let me summarize the contributions of our paper. We have designed and implemented novel specification methodology for closure-related verification in Rust, including history invariants, specification entailments, and call descriptions, as you have seen in this talk. You can find other features, such as ghost predicates, in the paper. In the paper, you can also find the specifics of the encoding of our methodology into first-order logic, the details of our implementation, and an informal analysis of closure usage in practice, based on data gathered from the top 500 Rust libraries from crates.io. Thank you for your attention.